We're in the TechCrunch studio today with Mark Goins, who's a partner at Morgan Thaler Ventures. Mark, welcome to the studio. Happy to be here. So you've been a longtime executive at Intuit, a longtime angel investor in the Valley, now been on Sand Hill Road for a few years, have a lot of experience working in and investing ar around, let's say, financial tools broadly. You used yes. to work at Chuck Schwab. Um, and you've developed a new kind of thesis around the small, medium business market. I'd love to hear more about it and sort of tell us how you got to that insight. Sure. So a, a lot of the businesses that are called SMBs are targeted by investors because they have 50, 100, 150 employees. And those are small businesses compared to, say, the Fortune 500 or Fortune 1000 or even Fortune 5000 companies, which have thousands of employees. And one of the things that I've noticed is that there's been a very high formation rate of businesses that are under five employees, and they can stay there for a long time and have very, very good businesses. Um, I call them really small businesses. And they have not been well served, typically, by various companies trying to provide them with software tools. They buy the generic tools, you know, they'll have Word or Excel, and they may have a banking relationship that they use to keep track of things. But there really hasn't been much in the way of web or mobile-based tools for them to run their business, whether it's a retail store or it's a personal services businesses like a plumber. Um, and so I find that's very interesting. And mm. they're forming at a high rate. Yeah. And the internet and mobile devices can deliver them very useful tools that they're willing to pay for to keep their businesses running well. So when you talk about RSBs, I think it would be helpful to know just one at a macro level what you think is going on, let's say global economy, US economy, right? People now maybe want to have their own businesses or maybe don't want to work in large companies or maybe feel like this kind of lifestyle path is what they want to do. And also maybe, you know, it's a kind of a tough, broad market to reach, right? So probably it's probably a huge market, but how do you get to those, you know, many, many mom and pop shops or many, many small online, really small businesses? Right. It's a really great question. One of the trends that um, I've seen over the last, um, say, 20 years is mm. that during recessionary periods, there's lots of formations of really small businesses. And there are a lot of formations of really small businesses on a continuing basis. You can see this through domain purchases. You can see this through folks that are starting uh, limited liability companies through these various online sites like NOLA or wherever where you can get your own company name and mm -hmm. company formation. And those numbers go up during downturns, but a lot of those businesses uh, continue after that. And so we see with recessions a, a flight there. And then of course, corporations are increasingly less reliable places to work. Used to be you could be there for your life, yeah. and now maybe you're there for five or seven years. When you own your own business, you're in charge. And people who get through the starting phase tend to be happier, and they hear about that. Um, if they're in a company and they try and start them. So you see a lot of formations and that's very interesting. So, you so that's see the that, first thing. You see that as just a massive secular trend. Right. And part of it, those, some of those jobs either aren't going to last forever or aren't coming back. To right. Think. That's okay. right. Okay. Then the second thing is that um, with um, internet, Google, search engines, mm -hmm. um, even tools that are available for Microsoft, these companies have been hard to reach, but are easier and easier to reach every day. Things like okay. Google Places that automatically find you and, and illustrate where you are. Yeah. And then these businesses also use those same search tools to find things to help them run their business. And so as a marketer, they're pretty easy to find now. You can um, identify uh, really small business owners by the search terms that they search on. And mm. I have a couple of companies that have been very successful at doing that. Or um, an example is uh, places where they tend to f um, do business, so eBay, Etsy. Those are really small businesses selling their products through those sites, and so you can reach them through partnerships with those sites. So they're ever increasingly available right. as targets for new products. And you're saying that the product or the product mix they currently have at their disposal are kind of primitive tools, right? Or so too sophisticated for them. Or too sophisticated, right? And so kind of what I think what's interesting about you is that you've been investing in this space broadly and also working as an operator in the space for such a long time, it'd be really neat to like sort of peel back the layers and say, okay, how did your time into it and how did your time, um, you know, investing as an angel in, in, in a lot of these companies that are broadly in this category lead you to kind of say, hey, this is, this is a good time for this. Right. So the couple of Intuit examples that I think are highly relevant, mm -hmm. one is that um, when 
uh, we look at the user base of TurboTax, a very high percentage of them filed the forms that are required to be filed when you're running a small business, the Schedule C and the Schedule E. So there's lots of them. Um, and then, and they did that themselves. They were filing their own tax returns using a self-directed product like that. And then a high percentage of Quicken users also were using Quicken to keep track of their business, not their, their personal life. And that actually is how QuickBooks was started, is, mm. wow, there's so many small business users using Quicken, we should have a better product for them. Uh, but as always occurs over time, that product became more and more capable of meeting the needs of the SMBs, yeah. and the RSBs were kind of left behind. And Quicken really isn't the right tool for them either. And so I keep seeing these trends evolve. And then, you know, you see the various uh, developments of marketplaces and other places where they can offer their services. And so they just keep forming and running businesses. Square's another example of a company that recognized a big opening in that market for payments processing. Mm -hmm. And it's a very, very large sector that the companies that are building sophisticated tools really don't serve with simple enough offerings. And so that's where I see the opportunity. Got it. Well, the tools that, that the new companies provide, do you have an example um, maybe in a company that you've invested in that's starting to chip away at the at these markets and reach reach this broader level of let's say fragmented fragmented potential users right so I'll give you two company examples of companies I've invested in mm -hmm. one as an angel okay and then another as a partner at Morgan Taylor so the first one is a company called Thumbtack okay and they help you find service providers to do things that you need that are on your Thumbtack list at home you know I need somebody to walk my dog I need somebody yeah. to do a wedding photography gig for me or whatever yeah. and those are really small operators that aren't really good at finding customers. And Thumbtack is all about helping them find customers by meandering through SEO f and identifying opportunities from search terms that these small business owners can turn into leads. And so they've built a business around that. It's doing fairly well. Mm. Um, another company that I invested in as a partner at Morgan Taylor is called Planet Soho. Mm. Soho Operating System, small home office operating system is their yeah. original idea. And yeah. it's simple things like keeping track of leads and helping keep track of things that I'm estimating and sending out to my customers, doing those estimates. Once I do the work, then invoicing them. So from leads to payments or leads to invoicing. Got it. And you know, when you think about it, you could do that with a spreadsheet and a Word document and you know, keep track of that all in contacts at, Yo at Yahoo or whatever. Mm -hmm. But you really want that all to be interrelated. And so Soho has built some super simple tools that companies can use to do that. And there's a million companies have signed up for that. Wow. And they've all been reached through web marketing. Got it. So the, pr the price of a sort of reaching those customers now online has probably compressed so low that it the, you can fill the engine up and get yeah, customers. Yeah, and, right? um, and Thumbtack really doesn't spend any money on marketing. They yeah. do it all through SEO. Yeah. Um, Planet Soho spends very little on a per customer basis in acquisition. Um, and so you can see where there's revenue opportunities with these businesses that can now be acquired. Historically, really small businesses have been very hard to find, reach, and retain. And so with great web delivery opportunities and good tools, um, classic marketing to really uh, models that are not unlike what Salesforce did originally, mm -hmm. uh, the consumerization of the enterprise, but at the very small enterprise level, mm. um, there's now great business opportunities to do business with them on a scaled level. And do companies who are trying to attack those markets find it difficult that you know the different types of RSBs that you call them are so different that they'll actually need customized tools if they're in a sp specific case. So like maybe someone running a plumbing company is going to have a very different need than someone running you know, a, a set of salons, right? That has certainly been one of the theses of investing. And for example, in the salon business, there's a company called Mind and Body that just delivers to health salons and salons. And yeah. they have a vertical enterprise model. Or okay. I have another company called Practice Fusion yeah. in my Morgan Taylor portfolio, and we go after doctor's offices. And yeah. we have very specialized tools in those two businesses. Yeah. Practice Fusion I'm in, Mind and Body I'm not. But they're very vertically oriented, but inevitably, we're talking about businesses that are doing five, 10, $15 million in revenue. And yeah. so the more verticalized those tools are, the harder they are for the really small businesses to use. So I see that as still an untapped sector. Absolutely. So let's say for someone who's out there thinking about serving this RSB market, right, as an entrepreneur, as a founder, okay. would you tell them to build, would, would you advise them to build broadly as they're, as they're conceptualizing what they're going to do or start 
um, with a vertical, you know, a, a, a vertical. Either approach works, but I prefer horizontal because I think okay. that's where you can build a great business. And mm. um, so you want to build tools that anybody can use, kind of like Excel. Anybody can use Excel yeah. for all kinds of applications. Yeah. So I think as broadly as possible with limited need to customize because their needs are very simple. Sure. I think the more you end up customizing, the more you lose the opportunity to work uh, horizontally. I see what you're saying. So maybe also you're saying build horizontally kind of like a platform. Right. Let people come to you and then they may send you signals and say, hey, actually, right. this vertical is actually super interesting. So you could deploy you know, resources or even a different product to that because right. you've gotten enough signals. Or if your platform is open enough, you could partner with someone who has a, something that's adds on vertically. Got um, it. Okay. Apple does that terrifically with their App Store. Great example. So let's shift gears a little bit and just talk about, let's say, angel investing and now you've you've moved up to, to Sand Hill Road and you know there's been a lot of high profile, very successful angel investors like yourself who have kind of gone gone down to Sand Hill Road or up to Sand Hill Road. <laughs> um, and to I, the dark side. Yes. And I, I'd just be curious, you know, Stepping back at a very high level, what have you seen change over the last, let's say, five to seven years um, that you think are material changes that are just now the new normal? So several trends. Um, there are certainly more entrepreneurs every day, and becoming an entrepreneur is a great thing. You know, it's like starting your own really small business, but trying to do it at something that would really scale. But yeah. venture investing is not necessarily for everyone. Angel investing is not necessarily for every company. Mm. Uh, so there's lots of formation. Similarly, there's these incubators, and boy, you know, has a bell rung? Is there a new incubator today? I mean, they're starting up and all so over the place. And so you're talking about incubators, accelerators, right. uh, all, all, all these of kind that. of vehicles. All okay. giving entrepreneurs the opportunity to form their business, get to a minimally viable product fairly quickly, yeah. and raise at least a little bit of capital to get started. Um, you know, seven, eight years ago, there were very few of those. They hardly existed. Sure. Um, and so I was doing direct investing through referrals that were made to me or people that I met that were in categories of interest to me. And there's, there were really several hundred angels, maybe several thousand, who did something very similar mm. in spaces that they knew a lot about. And I know a lot about financial technology and small businesses, so I invested in those categories. Yeah. There are others that knew more and, about other categories. And we should make the distinction, too, because the, the lexicon gets messed up, right? There are angel investors who are who are, let's say, longtime executives or people who have made their own money in some other fashion, right. investing their own money. Right. right. And then there's angel seed, institutionalized angels, micro VCs. Various fund sizes, if you will. Right. Who who are playing in that same game, right? Still writing right. $100,000 checks. Yes. Right. But it's not necessarily all their own money, and they have a larger portfolio. So a good example of that is when I invested in Mint. Yeah. Um, I was side by side with a, a small venture fund yeah. and a small um, seed capital fund. Okay. And, and myself. I was an individual. They were some semi-institutional, some fully institutional. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that, that's sort of when the trend started to evolve pretty rapidly where you were mixing all of those three elements together. Um, you still see some of that. Uh, but what's grown as a sector are the small funds or the incubators and other um, accelerators that are putting some of their money and some of their time into it, but they've institutionalized that process. Mm. And so now how do you, how do, well, actually, let's ask the most important question is, for an entrepreneur today, right, starting the next Mint versus five years ago, is it better for them now to not have those angels or those, you know, the individual angels? Are they better off? Or are their costs to that change as well? I think that on the whole they're better off, but there are costs okay. to that, and okay. and the costs are that uh, one of the things that's happened because of all of this, if you will, supply of yeah. capital and yeah. people interested in this, a large number of entrepreneurs are getting higher valuations than they might have when I was investing as an angel investor. Right. So as an angel investor, those returns are uh, really less available. It's a riskier investment for me now if I'm investing at a ten million dollar or a $5 million pre versus yeah. a one or two, yeah. I'm getting less of the company for the same dollar amount. So it's yeah. more risk for me. It's better for the entrepreneurs because they can get started unless they hit a plateau. And what they're doing is they're putting a lot of preference on top of their company at that high valuation. Yeah. So it may feel like it's worth $10 million and they get their two or $3 million in. But if it's really only worth four or five, and they can only sell it for four or five, right. their outcomes are compressed. So they're limiting limiting their exit outcomes, and you're also... Unless they have escape velocity, and then their outcomes can be awesome. 
Well, then it doesn't matter, right? Right. And I think that's everyone's dream. Yeah. But, you know, the chances of that happening and the reality are pretty too, slim. The reality, too, of most exits, right, which are considered success in venture, right, is they're mostly acquisitions that are right. in, in a smaller band. In a smaller bandwidth, right. Yeah. And the range of valuation makes it very difficult for them, I think, to get as much out of it as they had hoped as an entrepreneur. Got it, got it. Well, it was great to have you in here and talking about RSBs, which is a fascinating topic, and then also just reflecting on what's happening in the angel, angel side of the business. Thanks a lot. Thank you for doing the show. All right. Thanks, Mike.